Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 33 of the Gaming Rules podcast, where I talk about the games that I've been playing and various other things that I've been up to. Joining me in this episode as a special guest and co-host is Ryan from the Cardboard Republic and some advance warning that this podcast is a lot longer than normal. I enjoyed chatting with Ryan so much that in the interview section we kind of went on a little bit and I also asked him to join me for the section where I talk about the games that I've been playing and I had quite a bit to say about some of those games that I've been playing and I didn't feel in the editing process that there was very much that I wanted to really edit out. So yeah, just some advance warning, this podcast is a little bit longer than normal, you might want to break it up into two sections if you're normally used to listening to the short ones. I'm also going to start a new feature where I talk about a specific thing and then look for feedback on the BGG Guild. The guild has been pretty quiet of late, so I'm going to try something new to try and help out that. If you use Twitter, I'm on there at Gaming Rules Vids, Facebook, Gaming Rules Videos, and the Board Game Geek Guild is 2258. Thanks as always to the sponsors of the show, GamesLaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer, at gameslaw.com. Special guest. So joining me on the show this time is Ryan from Cardboard Republic. Hi, Ryan, and thanks for agreeing to be on the show. Hi, thanks for having me. And you've just come back from PAX East, I believe. I have. Uh, it's a three-day convention here in the Boston area, and I was enjoying myself, so I apologize if I'm a little hoarse. Uh, it's a lot of yelling <laughs> to be heard in there. So hot off the press news, because we're recording this on the Sunday. PAX East has, has finished today. Uh, it's primarily a video game convention, but you said about sort of 10, 15% of it is for tabletop board games. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. They get about uh, about 15 to 20 or so um, publishers that come in and set up booths and try to uh, show out some of their, their newer stuff. And, um, you know, this year was kind of different because they, they, did a, they uh, had a couple of slightly bigger publishers, more well-known publishers. So there was a small corner for Fantasy Flight and Asmodee, which was their first time this okay. year. Uh, but a lot of them tend to be kind of on the smaller side, more maybe more regional or, or uh, even on the indie side of things. So right. And what cool stuff did you see there? Then did you get to see anything new? So there was there was a number of things. Um, Unpub is there. So for those who are familiar okay. with the Unpublished Network, uh, they had a, they have a booth there, and so they would kind of foster uh, a lot of the Unpub games that come up from from these parts. And uh, so you know, saw a number of uh, games there that were particularly interesting. I think from from the Unpublished side, the two that were Really, the most interesting to me, uh, one was this game called uh, Laser Riders, which is um, a game that's being made by Cardboard Fortress, the folks who did Resistor. Okay, yeah. And the best way to describe this game is think of the light cycle race from Tron. Yeah, which is amazing. That's the game. That's it. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you're basically creating these kind of uh, rows and, and pathways of, of light of these your spaceship, and you're trying to get through a couple of different um, markers to try to score them. Um, but if you manage to cross another player's stream, uh, you crash and your thing falls okay. apart. And it's a very kind of st- simple... Uh, game, but it was a lot of fun. So I'm really curious to see where that one goes. That did you get to play that or just see? I it? did. Not only did I play, I won. Okay. And did you make the light cycle noises while you were playing? No, no, I, I, oh. I didn't. But I, have, I repeatedly <laughs> keep mentioning that this is like basically Tron without the IP, right. and you know how great it would be that you could. But obviously, it's Disney, yeah. so that's not going to happen. So okay. And what else did you see there that was of note? So um, aside from that, the other kind of Kickstarter that really caught my attention is this game system, really called uh, Lark Lamp which is actually, I think, on Kickstarter currently. He's kind of developing it, and it's this game system that's basically built around a lantern, like a light lantern, and okay. it has different panels, and that, that crew casts a light shadow onto the table, and then that, that shadow, that silhouette, is the board. And so you can do different things with it on there. And so the game comes with a physical lantern. It basically that is the that is the the game. Oh right. It, okay, right. So there is okay. no board. It's the board is the light that it casts based on how it's reflecting and all. And he's developing a whole system from it. So the the one that's on there currently on Kickstarter and the one he was demoing was uh, a 10 to 15 minute two player game about kind of this moth that you're moving around and trying to get him to go into the light. Uh, but he's developing some other uh, kind of games to work with it. Like, for example, I think he mentioned he was uh, developing a dungeon crawler that will kind of use the same thing. And he's, he's the idea is to have kind of this light game system all based around this lantern. It's very innovative. It looks really pretty. So I, I'm really curious to see where that goes, even though it's probably a year and a half or so before we'll actually see it um, right. You know, on, on the physical end, the completed end. 
Yeah. But uh, okay. you know, the biggest thing I think in terms of you know name worthy stuff that I had seen was I did get to play Widow's Walk, which is the upcoming expansion for Betrayal of House in the Hill. Right. So that was pretty exciting, even though we pretty sure we died but <laughs> as so that wasn't a prototype of it that would have been the finished version even though it's not it's not quite out yet like a pre-production copy or something it was yeah it was well it was pre-production components um which is why right. we, i didn't have any pictures or anything on that but the the rules are basically done the stories are done it's a pretty much a straightforward expansion so for those who are familiar with the game uh it's adding some more room tiles uh it's adding some new cards some new items and the uh, and 50 new stories. So it's doubling the amount of stories. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And there's all sorts of, you know, really cool people that kind of came together and uh, wrote some of these stories. So they weren't all just done by, you know, one or two people. There's a, it's a good litany of, of folks who, are, who made some of these stories. Some of them are kind of goofy. Some of them are, are really serious. And some of them are um, really eccentric. And I'd only got to peek at a few of them. I didn't want to spoil myself. Uh, yeah. But I did get to see some, you know, the names of the folks who are, who are doing it and the kind of stories that they're are being told. So, okay, cool. So that's some hot off the press news from PAX East. Before we get started with the rest of the interview, just tell the listeners a little bit, because some of the listeners here won't know what the Cardboard Republic is. So just tell us a little bit about it. Sure. So we are uh, primarily a gaming uh, review site. We also do some other written content. Uh, we h- have our own bi-weekly podcast called the Vox Republica, and we've actually started doing some video supplement on YouTube as well. Um, but yeah, primarily we're a written review site. We've been around for over three years now, and we kind of just, we look at games kind of on a holistic level and talk about them from the angle of what is this game trying to do? Who is it for? Um, and who is it best suited towards, more so than kind of like my personal opinion. Now, on the website, you've got an interesting section, which is the gamer archetype section. So just tell us a bit about that. Sure. And this kind of goes to the what I was getting at just a moment ago and in kind of the heart of what we decided to do when we were coming up with the whole idea of the site a few number of years ago. Um, and the best way I can describe it is think of a movie critic. And if you have if you take two really disparate movie types... Uh, say okay. some so a movie critic who really likes Victorian drama pieces, and then you have another person who they love the Marvel action hero movies. And right, those are very different movies aimed at very different audiences. And so, if you take one critic who favors one of those types and seat them down and make them watch the other, they may not be as favorable to that movie as a person who it's aimed towards. Okay, um, yeah. And there, and it's also hard to then take those two on different levels and say which is you know empirically a better movie than the other. Right. Um, it's really hard to do when you're doing it from a subjective review standpoint. What we decided to do was kind of fix that in a sense with the archetype system, which is what we built uh, our site around. It's kind of part of our philosophy and how we approach our reviews on the site. So we. Uh, in the archetype system, we have uh, six different kind of player profiles, uh, archetypes of player uh, behavior and player preferences as to how games um, are are run and, and kind of why you're playing them and the style of the game that you're trying to play. And then we look at games through that prism and saying, okay, of these six, and they're kind of they're, they're your you know, broad range type of stuff. And uh, most people fall into more than one category in every given yeah. time. It's there's, there's no very few people kind of are like once, you know, one category only at any given time, and they can change over time as well. But the idea is, if you have a game like Twilight Imperium, and that's a massive, really strategic, really kind of in-depth, involved game, and then you have something like Cards Against Humanity, which is very light, very, yep. you know, interactive, but light on rules, and those are very different games. So that's the same idea as the kind of the you know, the movie critic sort of thing. So yeah. they're aimed okay. at they're aimed at different audiences and we review the games based on those criteria. Right. So on the website, uh it was, if you go there, it's cardboardrepublic.com. There is a section of uh, what type of gamer are you? And it will ask you a series of fifteen questions and then it will um tell you what you are. I came out as tactician, which I think is probably about Right. Yeah, that's really no surprise knowing you, actually. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, some of them I answered and I looked at the question and I thought it was, the, I think it was the first question. It was, you're sitting down to play a game with a group of players who are really, really good at the game. What do you try and do? And I selected, well, I'll just wing it 
Because actually, actually, that doesn't mean I'm not going to take it seriously or anything like that. It's like, well, these are expert players. I'm going to lose. So my aim is to just learn as much about the game as I can, not to have a strategy, not to try and do a specific thing. Literally just play the game and see how it goes, come last, and then take my experience away. But that probably didn't put me in the category as a tactician, but most of the other questions probably did. Right, and there's a... The breakdown, obviously, the questions are randomized, and yeah. the breakdown will t- kind of tabulate the m- most common responses that you have based on those, yeah. and then kind of figure out uh, either the the primary or primary and secondary of that category. So we we actually yeah. developed that um, that quiz to uh, to help with that. So it's it's you know we acknowledge that it's one of those kind of it's the system that we have. We like it, um, but we also acknowledge that you kind of have to buy into it a little bit. Yeah. Um, but once you do, and you can take that quiz, and it's a, it takes two minutes, three minutes. Um, once you understand, okay, this is that profile that we're referring to when we talk about it in future things in our in our reviews and our other um, mediums, then you can go, okay, so this I'm that type of profile. This game is aimed at me. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you say that Cardboard Republic's been around for about three years or so. We, I think we technically, I think we just hit three and a half unofficially. Okay, okay. Th- your three and a half's birthday then. Hope you got a cake. No, I do oh. have a cookie though, so I'm going to go with that. <laughs> That'll do. Um, so that's been around for three and a half years. But how long would you say you've been seriously into games? before that or did it sort of happen at the same time well i've always had an interest in board games and that hasn't changed since i was a kid uh but that kind of for a long time it was more of your standard i i just like playing them and there really wasn't anything to that um and then i kind of stepped away from them a little bit in my teen years and going into my college years and kind of was more into the video game side it was more accessible and it was easier to do and i was enjoying it more Um, partially because that was kind of the burgeoning time of the resurgence of what what we consider modern board games. So it hadn't really kind of hit the the zenith and and that upswing that we're seeing now. Uh, So we were still, you're still largely limited to, you know, either imports, which I wasn't really familiar with at the time, or um, kind of that the early 90s type of stuff, which was either really kind of uh, out there on the peripheral of people's attention or they were still very much, at least in the U.S., being aimed towards kids, you know, yeah. aside from your classic Hasbro games. So uh, what I realized, though, is around, I know it was probably uh, back in 2000, probably mid-2000s, right after uh, I finished university, was uh, I got more interested in, in getting back into games. You know, I started seeing these new games that I hadn't quite heard about. You know, a, a friend of mine take, you know, invited me one night and we played this game called Arkham Horror, which got me really interested right. in it. Um, and then there was another time where I had nothing to do one night and somebody invited me over to a different house with a different group of people and, and there was this game Power Grid that I had never heard of. And then there was, right. really, okay. you know, stuff like that. And that really kind of spurned my my interest in getting, you know, into board games. And it was also fulfilling what I felt was missing from the video game experience that I was kind of finding was was on the, the decline of interest at, or at the same time because what I came to realize was the games that I loved as a teenager uh, were, were the ones that we were doing kind of the old LAN parties where you'd have people come over to the same yeah. house and you'd set up your network and you'd be playing these uh, these network games. So when you when you you know, kill somebody or you defeat somebody, you can yell down can, the hallway to the next exactly. room, right? <laughs> and that was the part that I loved. That I realized that that was the part that I really enjoyed was that interaction while playing the game. And it, right. it's a very different experience once everything shifted to being online. You don't yep. you don't have that anymore. You can still talk to people and engage with people in a game online, but it's not the same as to be able to walk down the room afterwards and say, "Oh man, I can't believe you just did that." And yeah. that's the part that really interested me. So board games really got me back into it, in, into that social aspect that I felt was missing, uh, okay. particularly in the latter years of, of really being into video games. So, but how long was it from then when you say started going to Gen Connor and things like that? It took, a, I would say, a couple of years of okay. kind of getting my feet in the water, finding out about these other games that I honestly you know, hadn't uh, realized existed. This was probably, I want to say probably uh, started thinking more seriously about getting into uh, going to conventions and starting to do coverage and stuff probably around 2008, 2009 or so. 
Right. Uh, and that's when I started kind of the I the, I started that formulative idea, and then I started checking into some uh, some regional conventions, some local conventions here, some smaller stuff, nothing crazy. Uh, probably around 2010, 2000, I'd say about 2010. And I would okay. and I would for so for a couple the first couple of years of that, I was just kind of going as a fan of gaming. Yeah. Um, and then it was in 2012 when we decided, we sat down, um, had a meeting with some folks here, and um, Aaron, who's part of the site, and, and then a couple other friends of mine, we decided, hey, let's let's actually go and, you know, let's do this. Let's actually do game coverages, and, and you know, we came up with the archetype system. That was all in uh, the summer of 2012, and so that's really, right. that's really where the, the, the switch came over into being beyond just, you know, really engaged as a fan to wanting to kind of be part of that and bringing something new to it yeah and where's it going to go now then for the next few years have you got any plans or just more of the same my goal is to get bought by asthma day yes well that's that's <laughs> been mine i keep waiting on the phone call but it, it, I, I, I i don't know i think i think they keep trying to ring but every time they ring i'm on the phone to the butchers ordering some meat it must it must be that yeah you know, they, they, busy signal it must be ringing us yeah. yeah it's you know they've got people ringing people all the time so maybe, you know maybe it's the wrong call you know, maybe they're like oh it's the, yeah it's the other paul grogan <laughs> it'd be a terrible thing when you find out that this like this completely unknown person and he's like oh, i'm a tax auditor and i just got bought by asthma day and you're, you're like, <laughs> well interestingly <laughs> enough i've had a couple of emails in the last month from companies in london contacting me saying oh i hear you're looking for office space in london and the first one i just went back to them and i said uh no you must have the wrong people and the second one i took a bit more interest i I went back and i said no i think you've got the wrong person but this is the second time now that somebody an agency has contacted me and said is gaming rules looking to buy office space in london and i said i'm a one-man company operating out of my house in Devon and they went oh according to our records gaming rules has a uh, hundred members of staff and you're looking to relocate into a central London location I'm like now that must be a different gaming rules <laughs> so it's like yeah it was, it was quite interesting they'd obviously heard gaming rules googled it found me emailed me and I'm like no think you've got the wrong person did you ever find out who that other company was no no I'm guessing it's some kind of casino or gambling firm or something like uh, that I who suppose knows that would make sense so on on your site i mean I've, I've, i i read a lot of your stuff and your videos and everything else and the thing that sort of strikes me is you cover a very wide variety of games mm-hmm. do you personally have a particular favorite type oh sure um so i m- much like you am, am very much on what we consider the tactician archetype um the, right. these are the heavy st- the people who like the heavy strategy and long-term planning in games so they like the meteor euro style games these are okay. these are the ones that you can kind of really sink your teeth into and, and kind of figure out uh something you know set up a, an engine maybe at the beginning of the game or, or build towards it and have a lot of moving pieces and yeah. Um, especially if you can pull off that grand reveal where you manage to, to pull out a win, you know, in the last round and nobody sees it coming. Like that's, that's the type of stuff that really gets us interested. Um, yeah. so you and I would, we, we'd probably have a pretty similar interest in game titles. Uh, yep. so that's, that's myself personally. Aaron is, um, what we call an architect. They're the civ builders. So okay. they're the folks who love like tiling games and, and being able to, to build their tableaus. Um, yep. you know, so your, your race for the galaxy type stuff, your suburbia is that sort of thing. Uh, right. so yeah, I mean, we, that's part of, part of one of the, part of the archetype system that we do and the way we cover them, um, which is also why it takes a little bit longer for us because we're trying out with different groups and different sizes and, and the like, yeah. um, is we will we will review games that may not necessarily fit you know personal preferences Yours. yeah in 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 order to kind of better accentuate who is this game f- aimed for so there are definitely times where I'll have a game and we'll we'll play it multiple times and I go okay I understand who this is aimed at and I can see why people would like that and 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 uh and stuff like that but but that's not but, you but that's sometimes. not my kind of game so that might be the yeah. kind of game that I will, will review but I may not personally keep it in my collection afterwards. Gotcha. And, that, and that's okay. nothing wrong. There's, there's definitely some great games out there that are just like not for me. Like if you have a, uh, a like a real time timed game, I'm I'm going to be terrible at it, and I'm yep. probably not gonna. <laughs> I'll probably play it, but I'm probably not going to walk away going, yeah, I got to go out and get that. Okay. You know, so but that's the advantage too. Is it, it's it's we're more wide uh wide net in terms of you know what we'll be willing to look at and that's not every that's not saying every game is is uh, amazing if a game is bad it's, we're still going to call them out on that yes 
Yeah. Okay. So one final question before we wrap things up, and that is your most anticipated games that are coming out soon. And I, I sort of mean this year, apart from Codenames Pictures, of course. Apart from that, which is obviously your most anticipated game, what other ones are you looking forward to? Oh, man. Well, now that you've said I can't use code names, <laughs> I'm not sure if I have any other answers. Okay. This answer brought to you by Check Games Edition. Yes. <laughs> Sponsored by. <laughs> right. Um, so that's a that's a tough one on the spot. I There's a couple, I think, that are going to be coming out at, around either Gen Con or Essen this year that I think are going to be particularly interested uh, okay. in... I'm always fascinated it, with uh, what's your name titles and what they're working on next. Um, and, and what's your game? What's your game? Sorry, yeah. And, what's your game? And, yeah. And so we've we've got Brazil. That's that's one of them. Yeah, that's Nuno and Polo's new game. So yeah, that's very high on my list. Oh, good. I'm trying to think what else. I know that there's a couple expansions uh, for various different games that I have that I'm always I'm always one of those people that I'm really curious about expansions and and what they're going to do. Um, I'm trying to think of like specific titles though. Oh man. Uh, there's the new one, I believe, that's coming out. I uh, that's for, from Gen Con. Uh, it is uh, being put out by Stronghold, and I'm all of a sudden drawing a name uh, blank on the name. Uh, it's the Martian one, Terraforming Mars. That's it. Yes. Yeah. And it was really funny because um, so I, I did one of these segments um, with I believe I think it was Robin's uh, podcast yep. back around the time of Essen last year. And he had he had us kind of say, well, what are some of the titles that you're you're seeing coming out at Essen that you're particularly interested in? And I, I vividly remember this because I went through and I kind of looked at what was being put out. And obviously, we don't get to go to Essen because uh, <laughs> we don't make money on what we do. So and you're on the other side of the world. So yeah, so we have to we have to justify that one. Eventually, we'd like to to get over and try Essen Spiel, but it's uh, uh, one step at a time. Yep. Um, so we ended up doing a segment on it instead, and we had three to five games that we wanted to to check out. If we we, we could go, what are the three to five games that we'd look at? And right. and one of my five was this little unknown game that no one was paying attention to called Terraforming Mars. And I was right. really intrigued by this game. It, it looked like it was kind of this this heavier thing. There was an unknown publisher, but I really liked what I was reading about what it was doing. And then nobody else really kind of mentioned it. And then. A couple months later, all of a sudden, news came out that Stronghold had signed it for U.S. distribution, and it was yep. going to be coming out, and, and now it was this big thing, and it's going to be their big Gen Con release, and I, I just kind of found it really funny that um, that was something... You, that, you were interested in it I, before. Yeah, yeah, I was interested in it before it was... That sounds so hipster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Stephen Bonacore has got very good uh, taste in choosing which games to to pick up. He has a lot of people... Uh, you know, approaching him, and I know the guy that worked with him at Essen last year and had all the meetings with him, uh, and he's a guy who's got really good taste and, and trust as well. And that was obviously one of the things that came out of it. They had dozens of meetings with all sorts of different people, picked the ones that they felt were going to be the best games, and uh, yeah, from everything I've heard about it, it's on my it's on my watch list as well. So um, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, it's still early in the year, and lots of the titles that will be coming out this year haven't been announced yet yeah and that's always part of it is sometimes they they will save some of the big reveals for some of those later conventions to still keep keep them relevant and and you know purposefully interested so there's definitely titles that are kind of on the on my radar and i'm sure i have a list somewhere that i was like i I don't build a geek list or anything like that i know some folks that they'll kind of build a a list out and say okay these are the these are the games that i've heard about that i definitely want to look out for and like i'm I'm, i take it kind of more organically and saying oh that's right this is coming out soon or or this one just came out and um you know there's a lot of plus it's i have kind of a wide variety of interest in the styles and themes of games as well so i try to keep it um I try not to, to hyper-focus on, on any one particular publisher or one particular style of game, um, even though I could, and just kind of go, I'm going to focus on, on only these type of games, only, you know, cube-pushing Euro games, because I have a soft yeah. spot for those, obviously. But I also like kind of some weird, kind of like zany light games and stuff, too. So, um, you know, I, I guess another one that kind of just suddenly came to mind is, is I really want to be, I want to take a look at that Mystic Veil that's coming out by AEG later this year. Right. Um, have you seen that one? I haven't, no. Uh, this one is... Are you familiar with um, Gloom, the game Gloom? Yes. So this Mystic Veil is coming out. I want to say it's either Origins or Gen Con this year. And 
it is supposed to be um it's a card game and it's going to use it's kind of using like a deck building mechanic but it's using the card overlays that you kind of see in gloom so the, right, the cards okay, actually yep. evolve They're transparent yeah um, so, so you, yeah. you can actually put the things on top of them and the cards get more powerful over time because of the overlay right. so like i think that's a really novel thing um and, okay. I, and i always like seeing those new and different um, aspects of the game that's that's also why the other half of what we do besides the archetype review system is we kind of have a soft spot for the indie uh the indie side of things and the up-and-coming designers and and what is new in the industry and that sort of thing so well they've got june 2016 as the release so So that probably origins be there for yeah um yeah probably origins and yeah, that'll be available later this year. So, um, right. So that's it for the special guest section of the show. Just before we finish, if people want to find you, it's cardboardrepublic.com and on YouTube, Cardboard Republic. Yeah, we try to keep it simple. Yeah, that's <laughs> where it is. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much for joining me for this section, and I'll see you in the next section of the show. Thanks. What Paul has played. Okay, so Ryan is joining me again for the uh, for this section of the show where I'm going to talk about some of the games that I've been playing. Uh, so thanks again for, for joining me. No, you're welcome. And the first one I wanted to say is a game which we played yesterday, and this was Case 4 from Time Stories, which is Under the Mask. Now, before you switch off, uh, I'm not going to give any spoilers about it at all, uh, apart from I'm going to say that four of us played it, we all really enjoyed it. One of the players, I think, said that he was his favourite one so far. Um, it took us just over four hours, and we always play in one sitting because there's so much, so much going on and so much to remember. I couldn't imagine, you know, leaving it a week between sessions. Um, so what I will say about it is, it's got some new cool stuff in there, and rulings-wise and ambiguity-wise, it was a lot better than the previous one. Prophecy of Dragons, unfortunately, had. Lots of cards which you read and went, uh, that doesn't make sense. And a couple of cards where rulings were actually missing from the cards. This one didn't really have much of that. Uh, and we all had a really good time playing it. So, yeah, very, very happy. It was a really good day yesterday. Um, so that's Time Stories Case for Under the Mask, which I know a lot of other people are playing because it came out last week, I think. Far ahead of us. <laughs> You've tried Time Stories? We have. We're still on the first, on the base game. Right. Uh, we don't. We don't do it all in one sitting, and right. we actually were holding off on it for so long until we finished Pandemic Legacy. Right. Okay. Which we only did um, like three weeks ago. Oh right. So you're on. Uh, you're on. You're just on Asylum then. We are just in the just in the paltry beginnings. Yeah. But that segues nicely into Pandemic Legacy, which I finally. I know I'm late to the party on this, but a friend of mine, Mark got his copy two weeks ago and uh, since my last podcast we've actually had two sessions so we played a week ago on Thursday and then again last Thursday we did three session, uh, three games in each so we are and we, we, we're doing really well we are on five wins and one loss so we're actually at the, we've already reached the end of May which is where we are with the story and again before you switch off I'm not going to give any spoilers apart from to say that we're all really enjoying it, which everybody seems to be. I mean, it, it's, it's number one game on Board Game Geek, which personally I don't think it should be. Don't get me wrong. It's a great experience. And as I say, we're all enjoying it. But as for, is it the best game ever? I don't I don't think it is. So where are you up to with Pandemic Legacy? Well, we have finished. So I, again, I, I won't go into it in, in, anything there. You know, and we, looking back and uh, looking back on it, we, we really enjoyed the experience. And I'm one of those people who is skeptical on the idea of a legacy system. Yeah, me too. Uh, the idea of, of you're going to actually, you're going to put that on the board yep. permanently? You're yep. going gonna to rip <laughs> that up? You, you, what do you, uh, well, what we are don't you doing? rip anything up. I have to admit, we have an envelope that says on it things that have been ripped up. And we huh. put it in the envelope and we put it away because none of us really want to destroy components so, so we're not we, really I, ripping them up <laughs> i tried to do that at the very beginning <laughs> and i believe it was erin she stole the card away and ripped it up oh, in front of God. me just just so we were establishing that it was going to happen right and you had to get into it and uh and it worked and and so we actually each took turns on on whenever that happens when something um gets removed or something like that yeah that we kind of each each part uh participated in it. we used the same group even though we did it over the you know span of about uh, two or three months okay. actually 
Okay. But it was it was a great it was a great experience. I really like uh, what it did. I you know stand corrected on my on my uh, reservations on it. It created a nice uh, thematic experience. It did feel like it progressed yeah. throughout the entire uh, playthrough. So I don't I don't regret it at all. On and uh, now as to whether it's the greatest game ever, I I don't know. Um, I. I don't know if it would be considered the greatest game ever, but then again, I'm also not one of those people that thinks Twilight Struggle is the greatest game ever right. either. So, okay, uh, t- to take that as you will. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think the whole legacy thing, I think, has got people more excited than the game actually deserves credit for. And this this sounds like I'm being really negative on it. Playing Pandemic Legacy, and I've only we've only played it, you know, over two different days. It's been brilliant. The experience of getting together, playing the game. The journey that we're all going on together, we're all loving it. And when you get that thing and it says open box three, we're all like kids in a candy store. I mean, we're, we're, we're like, I think we're all in our 40s and we're all there going, oh my God, we get to open a box. Whose turn is it? Oh, it's me. Rip it up. And when you open it up and you take out what's inside, we're all like, oh, wow, this is really exciting. And we're trying to tell this to, I, I was speaking to my girlfriend about it. She says, you sound like you're like five years old. And I'm like, yeah, but it's so cool. And it is really cool, and it's really exciting, because apart from Risk Legacy, it's not been done before. This is new. This is exciting. And I'm trying to think where we're going to be in five years, where we've got three or four Legacy games coming out every year, if not more. And in five years' time, I read a bit of thing, and it says Open Box 3. Am I still going to be going, oh, I get to Open Box 3, oh, this is really... I don't know. Is it, is it going to wear off? I'm not sure, but right now, it is the best. You know, one of the best gaming experiences that we're having because it's new and it's exciting and it's fresh. Yeah, it's a different avenue to explore that games haven't really yeah. touched touched upon, and it's been done well. Rob Rob Davio is the fo- the, the, the person yeah. who really kind of spearheaded this when he uh, when he created Risk Legacy, and Risk Legacy was one of those that people who had originally got into it, uh, they really came away liking the idea of it. Um, but a lot of people kind of, you know, didn't really pay a lot of attention to it at first because it was still obsessively risk. risk. Yeah. Um, but then they said, hey, we're going to take this really beloved game called Pandemic and we're going to let you mostly play the same game, but we're going to add this legacy component to it. And and then just sort of took off like wildfire yeah. from there because he took this really novel, innovative system with a already well liked game and a, an existing IP and said, okay, here we're going to go from there. Yeah. So the right choice of game to do it with, absolutely. Right. right. So the next batch of them are going to be particularly interesting, and I think that's where you're going to see how much of an interest there is in the mechanic of a legacy system. Yeah. Um, because you have Seafall, which is coming out later yeah, this year. Yeah, which I'm which, super excited about because that's going to be the next big legacy game kind of thing. It, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's that's it's kind of a no-brainer on that sense. It's it's There's a handful of designers that have all had their hands on it. Rob was involved in it. It's being put out by Plaid Hat Games, yeah. which a lot of people automatically yeah. uh, gravitate towards. It's going to be a Gen Con release. So it's going to be a big, hyped game. And, and it's it sounded... Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a bit meatier in its execution than Pandemic. A Pandemic, part of its appeal to, I think, the wider audience is the fact that uh, it's still pan- games of Pandemic, and those games are going to take 45 to 60 minutes to play. Yep. Whereas uh, Seafall games are going to be longer than that. They're going to be more, like, closer to two-hour games. Okay. Uh, but there's going to be fewer of them, because like, Pandemic, yeah. you can do 12 to 24 playthroughs, Whereas I think Seafall is aiming for about like twelve to fifteen. Okay, but they're, but they're going to be twice as long. Yeah. So um, you're getting about the same amount of playtime on them, but the involvement is going to be a little heavier. So yeah. you know that that's going to be a great example of okay, is it the legacy system or was it just because it was pandemic that really got people's attention or the combination? I of? think and the then legacy also, system. Uh, I think know, so too. You're right. Yeah, I think it is probably a bit of both. You couldn't have done you know insert random game here that isn't well respected and put a legacy on it, and it would sell as well as Pandemic Legacy. So you're right, Pandemic is a, is a known brand, and it's very big, and it's very popular. So yeah. so Seafall's going to be out at Gen Con. So day zero of Gen Con, the setup day, the CGE guys are going to be wondering where I am and why I'm not helping them set up the booth, because I'll be over at the plaid hat stand wrangling a copy of Seafall off them. 
Right. Yeah, okay. it's probably not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they say, "Where's Paul?" Well, I'll be I'll be there, you know, opening it up and looking at all the boxes with the numbers on, saying, "Oh, I can't open them." Um. Um, but yes, Pandemic Legacy. I was skeptical as well going into it, and I'm 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 very happy with it. I think thematically between games, some of the things don't really fit. You know, the game kind of resets at the end of the game, and then you you, you play month two which is another game of Pandemic. And it basically, you know, some of the bits transfer over from one to another, but most of the board clears. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. Only only a few weeks ago, we we did that, and that's gone now. So <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's hard it, to say without going exactly, into detail. Exactly, but it, it couldn't have been done any other way. I'm not, I'm not criticising it. I'm just saying there's no other way that they could have done it. Uh, it's just it was just one of those. Li- I'm trying to find little niggles with it because I'm I'm really enjoying it. So anyway, moving on from Pandemic Legacy, another game that I've been late to the party to is Seven Wonders Duel, um, which a friend of mine Mark got, and uh, lots and lots of people have been playing this, and I know it's it's really high on the rankings on BGG. I think it's in the top twenty, and um, I finally got around to playing it, and I can see what all the buzz is about. I really enjoyed the game. It plays really quick, so. For the length of time that the game takes, it is very, very good. There's definitely more depth to it than some other card-driven games, and there's definitely a skill to it, because I've lost every single game so far. So Mark's really good at it, and I'm hoping to get, get better at it. You uh, you played this one? I have, and I am sort of uh, in a situation with Seven Wonders Duel that I have been with a couple other games that got a lot of hype in the past, which is I'm not actually that blown away by it on a personal level. Right. Um, I like Seven Wonders. I like the Seven Wonders uh, system, and I think that, and I think you know, Bowser does a great job with what with his um, his IP, and he's always come up with new ways of kind of implementing it. Um, but I don't know. I just didn't really get that excited about it. I've played it probably about a half a dozen times now. Yeah. And I played it with multiple different people, and I, I mean, I win them more than not, and so maybe that's just saying something about me getting into the game. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, it wasn't... Okay. I, I walked away from it playing, you know, I, I like what it does. I recognize that it's it's um, it's a good system, and I can see why people really like it. But for me, and on a personal level, um, part I have a hard time with two-player games in general, um, because partially just because of my audience and who I'm playing with yeah. uh, for my game groups. Sometimes finding, you know, one-on-one game nights is really difficult. And uh, and Aaron doesn't really like a lot of the kind of like strategic tactical uh, two-player games that exist ad nauseum out there. So I have to be a little bit more selective on that. But I don't know. I just, I, I every time that I've played it, I've finished the game and said, you know, I'd rather just play Seven Wonders. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it was a great game. I'm saying it's a good game. I'm I'm also not as blown away by it as a lot of people have. I mean, a lot of people said, oh, it was their best game for Messin last year. And I'm thinking, as I said earlier on, for the length of game that it is, it, it's good. I wouldn't yeah. want it to be much longer than that. But yeah, it is a good game. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's one of these games, I, I'll play it. If anyone says, says, says sit down and hey, you want to play Seven Wonders Duel, I'll say, okay. Uh, but it's not a game I'm going to actually go out and buy and, and add to my collection. <laughs> Just a quick note, this is Paul in the editing studio. This next bit of audio, I don't quite know what went wrong with my audio, but it's really bad quality, and uh, it's not for a very long time. It does correct itself soon, so please bear with me. Another game that I just got recently is 51st State Master Set, which I got an early copy of it. Uh, I don't think it's actually out yet, but since I helped to write and edit the rule book, uh, Ignacy was kind enough to send me a copy of it to play, and um, I, I have played a two-player game of it, just last week. So for those people who were expecting 51st State to be a reskin of Imperial Settlers, then it's not. It does share a lot of mechanics with Imperial Settlers, which Imperial Settlers, for those people who don't know, was a progression on from the original 51st State. So 51st State came first, then Imperial Settlers came out, which took the 51st State mechanics and tweaked them and streamlined them. And now the 51st State Master Set is building on that but it's definitely different from Imperial Settlers. So, for example, there's no faction decks. So you just have one big deck of cards in the middle that everybody's drawing from, and each of the cards has a distance value on it, which is either one, two, or three, and that distance is how many contact tokens you need to play the card. So if the card is, for example, at distance two, 
if you want to make a deal with it, you have to use two blue tokens. If you want to raise it, you have to use two red tokens. And if you want to build it, you have to use two grey tokens. So that that's just a quick, you know, a lot of the game is the same. I'm not saying it's completely different, but there's enough differences to it that it isn't just Imperial Settlers in a post-apocalyptic setting. I'm assuming you've played Imperial Settlers. I have played Imperial Settlers. I have not actually played 51st State, the, either the, the original um, or the, the revamped version. I've, I've seen it in action. Um, we actually did a gaming charity event in these parts um, a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, Anthony Ricano from the Cardboard Jungle, he had his mm. advanced copy. Yes, I knew uh, he from- had one. Yeah. Yeah, so he he had brought that to it, and so I they, I was contemplating trying to get in on a game of that, but we ended up um, doing some other games instead with some other folks, and so I haven't actually got to, to try the fifty the uh, the master set, yep. but um, I keep getting tempted by it. I, yeah, I have to admit. I mean, I played it with Mark, who I've mentioned a few times now in this podcast, um, because Mark is really good at Imperial Settlers and really really likes Imperial Settlers, so I thought right, it, it's a good good time and we were playing it and we got to the end of round one and we were like right there's a lot more to this isn't there you know the, there was a lot more going on than there was in a game of imperial settlers there was a lot more to think about and it isn't just get resources and then spend the resources now what you do is you get these resources then you have to convert these resources to these contact tokens and then you use the contact tokens to then do the stuff so there is an extra layer of of stuff going on and it's not just um i'm not saying that as a bad thing i'm not saying oh there's this extra step that, that's meaningless because sometimes you do some of the card abilities do require the resources the contact tokens are needed for you to actually play the card but most of the card abilities actually need the the resources and although there's no faction deck there are different factions within the game and they all convert the resources to the contact tokens at a different rate so the mutants for example they convert one gun token to three red contact tokens because they're really good at it but they're really bad at making deals so they convert one fuel into one blue token whereas the one i played converted one fuel into three blue tokens so yeah the factions do all play differently based on based on how they convert the resources so yeah definitely looking forward to playing that a little bit more now let me ask you a question so for for folks who who have Imperial Settlers but don't quite have 51st State because it hasn't come out just yet yep. s- soon, uh, what is the selling point to them? Well, can So give, give kind of the pitch as to, for somebody who owns Imperial Settlers, why should they get 51st State? If you State? like Imperial Settlers, i.e. not just the fact that it's got cute artwork and things like that, if you like the mechanics and the way that the game plays, the chances are you're going to like 51st State as well. And because it is quite different it isn't just the same game with the reskin so i know and you know having written the rules and and then having reread the rules afterwards and then playing it uh it was only when i started playing it that things started going oh really this really does feel different it, i i think you should definitely take a look at it what i think you shouldn't do is go i've already got imperial settlers i'm going to completely ignore 51st date because as i say it is different so definitely definitely have a look at it so they can both happily coexist on the same Absolutely. shelf. Absolutely. Some people will right. prefer one, some people will prefer the other, but they're, they're for sh- sufficiently different, I think, for both to be owned in the collection. So uh, anyway, enough about some of the games I've been playing. What have you been playing? So I've been introducing a number of folks to The Grizzled. Right. Uh, which I believe, I'm assuming you've played at this point. I have, and again, I was fairly late to the party with that one. I think I've played it three or four times. Cool. Yeah, this is one of these games that I, when I go and over a friend's house or something like that, I just always throw it in the bag because it's a quick, easy co-op yep. game. Um, it's it's very easy to to teach and people kind of get the feel for it very quickly. Yes. And um, it, it's it's just a nice thematic game. I know it got a lot of um, attention and fanfare for the circumstances around the yep. game and the, for the people involved with that um, and the Charlie Hebdo thing. Uh, but it's a good game overall. Yeah. I and mean, you know, you cool me or not, they bought it here for distribution in the U.S. And uh, there's an expansion coming out for it now. But this has become one of those games that I, uh, if they're looking for kind of like a, a twenty-ish, you know, twenty to thirty-minute kind of quick co-op game, uh, this is one I keep throwing down. Yeah. So we've been playing it a lot lately. And have you ever won? And so I have uh, a pretty good track record of, compared to a lot of people okay. with this game. Um, I don't know if it's just uh, some sort of mystical um, association with uh, the characters or something like that, but 
yeah, I, I do tend to have a pretty good um, job with it. It obviously depends on the player size. Yes. It, it, is, it is progressively easier with fewer players. I've heard it doesn't scale too well with more players. It does not. It gets it gets like exponentially harder. I have never won with five players. I'll right. put it that way. Um, but I have won with four a cup a few times, um, which is not always easy. And uh, and three is is usually if you if, as long as you don't get into a really bad stretch of cards, um, you can do three if you manage it right. Okay. So, but it's yeah, it's still it's still hard. You know, it's still in that uh, you know ghost story samurai spirit level yep. difficulty. Um, and that's part of why it's so endearing, I think, is because it's it's just brutal. <laughs> War is hell. Yeah, no, it's been played quite a bit at our local club on a Tuesday, and it's been um, it's been going down very well there. Unfortunately, that's that's a problem with it because they haven't won a game yet, so they think right, we want to play it, we want three people, but then of course come other, some other people come up and go, oh yeah, the grizzled, yeah, we played that last week. Can I join in? Right. And you don't really want to say no, but all of a sudden you've got four people. Okay. And then you're like, oh, okay, we're not going to do it now, you know. So it's kind of like they want to just um, say, right, there's three of us, nobody else, just us three, and then just, just keep playing it until they do it. But yeah, the, when when they actually do eventually succeed, I'm sure there will be celebration dancing going on. Yeah, so. the, 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 the best uh, example I have of that, we were I was at um, BGG... Uh, this past this past fall, and we actually were playing a game with some folks, and one of those folks was um, uh, Marty Connell from yep. uh, Roll Dice Taking Names, and it, I guess it, I, I wasn't familiar with this uh, the situation at the time, but apparently it had been an ongoing rec- like kind of known thing that he had never won yes. Grizzled, and and so he we actually sat down and we played it. Uh, and and we won, and he was so elated, he was ecstatic. And there's there's actually pictures on Twitter you can find. I it remember of. seeing the posts. Well, I mean, I was there at the time, so I remember them talking about it. Yeah, right. And he he was just so excited, and it's that level of excitement of oh, we did it, we completed it, and with the traps, no less. You know, because you got to play with the traps. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's that sort of excitement when that happens. I mean, I, that I remember when that happened to to myself. Um, only a few months ago, when I when my when a group that I was playing with beat Ghost Stories for the first right. time. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because that's challenging. Because I've probably played that game twenty times, and that was the first time I'd ever won it. Right. Nice. And so, so it, it is when you get that level of of failure to success rate on a game, especially on a co op, and when you can actually eke out that win, it is it is just such a, a rewarding feeling. Yeah. So one another one that you've been playing recently. So I, conveniently enough, got to actually play Colosseum for the first time. The new one? No, not the new one. This was actually the original Days of Wonder edition. Oh, right. Okay. The one that's really um, hard to get hold of. Yes, because I, I, um, I was lucky enough to actually was at the same uh, charity event. Um, folks had it. And I had never played Colosseum before. Right. And, and so this kind of coincided really well because I, there was all, there's been a lot of kind of chatter online about the revamped edition. Yeah, because that's uh, coming out the, soon, isn't it? Uh, it? It was kickstarted on um, not too, I think it was not too long ago or just ended. Right. Um, it's being put out by uh, Tasty, Tasty Minstrel. Tasty yeah. Yeah, and so they're, they're basically redoing the game with all new art yep. and, and a new layout. Um, obviously, there's a whole thing about the, the they got the rights back to it because it wasn't reprinted in a number of years. They got the design rights back to it anyway. The artistic rights are still owned by Days of Wonder, which right. is why they com- they did completely new art and layout. And I guess there was I, I wasn't really paying attention to it. Again, there was a lot of chatter back and forth about whether or not you like the new artwork or you don't, the new layout or you don't. I honestly didn't pay a lot of attention to it because I didn't really have any good focal point. I, I never played it, so I had really no kind of stake in the game one way or the other. So, yep. um, I, have you played Colosseum? Uh, yeah, but like possibly when it first came out. I don't. I can't <laughs> even remember who had a copy. I remember playing it. I remember really liking it, and then it sort of faded away. And yeah, I don't know anybody who's who's got it now. But yeah, yeah, we we like I said, we were lucky enough that we had a copy because it, it came, originally came out in. Like 2006, 2007. Right, okay. And I get, this goes back to what I was saying before, where this was, the, that kind of predates, or right around the co- you know, same time where I was, you know, really just getting back into it on, a, on yeah. a heavier scale. And it was just probably one of those ones that I didn't, you know, know somebody who had it at the time, and I wasn't really that plugged in to go looking for it myself. Um, and obviously it's been out of print for years now. 
it was it was a fun game. So it, it's a game about um, you're trying to kind of build up your show. You're putting on shows for the elites of the Roman um, hierarchy, so the senators and the emperor themselves, and you're trying to get them to come, and you're trying to put put on bigger performances, and you have to get the resources to do that. So there's, a, there's like a bidding mechanic, and then there's sort of a trading mechanic where you're trying to get – you know, oh, I need these lions for my show, or you know, I need to, I need to get this this archway for my for my show, and that sort of thing. And so you're trying to to build these up, and you're getting money that you then in turn spend to buy more stuff and make your stage bigger. And it's you know, they move around a board, so it's you know, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward resource management and, and negotiation game. So, but it's it was a lot of fun, and um, I'm not saying that just because I, I handily won. I, I was actually losing most of the game, but in pure tactician fashion, I managed to uh, my literally my last turn get like a forty point score right. or fifty point score, and and just leapfrogged the next highest. Were you saving by, like, for one months. of the big shows then, and you were collecting all of the the lions, as you say, and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, it was exactly that. I, I basically wasted the second to last turn just setting myself up. Uh, not doing pretty much anything. I didn't buy anything. Didn't trade anything. And and I just sort of sat there uh, the, the the second to last round, knowing that the last round uh, I was going to have this explosive finish. And and it worked because I, I I I beat the next highest person yeah. by like thirty points. <laughs> okay, so that's Colosseum, which as I say is is an old days of, days of wonder game. Been out of print for many years. Tasty Minstrel have picked it up, and they're they're publishing it this year. And we both liked it. So. There you yeah. go. Keep an eye out for that one. Um, and, and the new one is going to be a lot cheaper than than uh, trying to find an older copy. That's yeah, for sure. that's the thing because it, because it, it's old and out of print, but was regarded as a good game from what I remember. It, it was one of those which is quite sought after, and prices were high on the secondary market. But yeah, not now. Yeah, it's you know either sell your old copy or or just uh, plan on being able to pick it up for the first time for much much cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Right, so that's some of the games that we've been playing over the last few weeks. Thanks very much for joining me on this section, and again for for being on the section earlier. And um, I'll see you later on this year. Yeah, anytime. Cool. Cheers. Gaming rules news. Good news on the Tolkien video. As far as I'm concerned, it's done, and it's just waiting on CG's approval now. I've also been doing more rulebook work for Portal Games, Ludic Creations and Space Cowboys for games that are coming out this year. Uh, this week I'm also due to start on the video for Mythic Battles Pantheon, which is a miniatures combat game coming to Kickstarter later this year. Uh, this was the, the trip to Paris that I made earlier on this year. This was for this game and it's being published and the guys from Monolith are helping out with it. So they are, they are linked in with it and the Kickstarter has been delayed because Conan hasn't been delivered yet. But I'm expecting this to be another big one um, because, as I say, it's got the backing of the people who did Conan. It's got really nice miniatures, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, one of the other things that I'm up to at the moment is I've started a board gaming group in my local town. Now, I've been putting a lot of effort into this over the last few months, trying to raise awareness of it, advertising it on local Facebook groups, printing out flyers, putting them in shop windows, and trying to spread the word, going to various local events to tell people about it. The local community centre has been really good. They've given me the room for free on a trial basis, and the idea is that I'm just trying to introduce modern board games, really, to people in town who have no idea they exist. Um, it's a combination of wanting to do more for the local community, which I'm trying to do more of at the moment, and obviously introducing people to board games. So this brings me on to the new section of the show. Now, this idea is one that I got from one of the podcasts that I listen to, which is the Perfect Information podcast with Ben and uh, that, that other guy. I can't remember his name. George, I think. Anyway, um, I went on to a quiz night last Friday, and which was also held at the community centre, um, which is where the board games are going to be. And they allowed me, during the interval, to stand up in front of everybody and tell people about the board games night. So I'm just curious as to if you were in that situation, how would you, you've got a couple of minutes to try and explain to non-gamers what modern board games are, to try and pique their interest and to try and get them to give it a chance and come along if they are free. Now, clearly I had to say that this is not Monopoly or Scrabble because I didn't want anybody turning up expecting to play those kind of games. I also wanted to try and target the audience for people who had played those games 
and didn't enjoy them. So there's a stigma with board games in the UK is like, oh, do you want to play a board game? Ah, oh, no, they're the ones we play at Christmas with the kids and I don't enjoy them. They're the kind of people that I'm interested in saying, you know, these are not those kind of games. I think it's quite a hard sell to explain in a short period of time in front of people you don't know what modern board games are. So I'm just after, you know, I've already done it, but I'm after other people's opinions. So I'm going to start a thread on the BGG Guild. And if you've got any ideas about how you would do this, then uh, please pop onto the Guild. It's 2258 if you're not already a member and join in a discussion. As I say, I'll put a link to the Guild and to the thread in the show notes on the website and on the YouTube version of this podcast. And that's all I've got time for this week. So thanks again to Ryan for joining me. Thanks again to the sponsors of the show, Games Law, and also to Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for the music used in this podcast. Take care and thanks for listening.